Good evening, everyone. My name is Ravi Ramamurthy, and I'm the director of the Center for Emerging Markets at Northeastern University. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are delighted to launch the China Insight series uh, this week. As you may know, if you've come to our other events, we've been doing a number of events focused on India over the last few years. We started an India lecture series about three years back, which has a lot of uh, following and we had some terrific speakers. Uh, last year, we started the China lecture series. And I'm delighted that today we're going to start the China Insight series. And as you have uh, probably seen, we're going to feature three of our faculty members in this series. Michael Enright, who will be speaking today, uh, George Yip uh, down the road, and Dave Sherman uh, towards the end of the series. Uh, it's particularly great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Michael, who along with George Yip are two real heavyweights that we've added to our group in the last year. They're both very uh, knowledgeable and have deep experience in China. And that has added to our tremendously to our China bench strength. So you can at anticipate several events and programs focused on China in the future. To kick us uh, off, the, kick off the series, I'm delighted that we have Michael Enright today. Michael uh, is has been in China in, or in the Asia region, I should say, Hong Kong, Singapore, and has done extensive work with companies and governments in Asia for the last 25 years. He got his undergraduate degree, his MBA, and his PhD from Harvard. He worked with Michael Porter on the Competitive Advantage of Nations project. He taught at Harvard Business School for a couple of years and then moved to Hong Kong. Uh, he, planning probably to spend four or five years there and ended up spending almost 25 years. Uh, we're delighted that now that he's decided to come back to the US that he's joined us here as the Pierre Chuari Family Professor of Global Business and a fellow of the Center for Emerging Markets. Michael works on international competitiveness, regional economic development and international business uh, strategy. He has consulted with many companies. He had his own consulting com company out of Hong Kong and Singapore that worked with many global corporations as well as governments in Asia and other parts of the uh, developing and developed world. He is going to start focus today on the Chinese uh, system, the system within which China operates. Uh, I think the plan is that he will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then there'll be time for Q&A. Please, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box, and I will be curating them and feeding them to Michael towards the end of the uh, session. Uh, Michael may have some other guidelines on what kinds of questions he would particularly uh, love to respond to, and I'll let Michael uh, say more about that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. Michael, welcome again to Northeastern. Delighted to have you here and really looking forward to this talk. Folks, I think it's going to be a real treat. Over to you, Michael. Okay, thank you, Ravi. And welcome uh, to all of you who have uh, participated or who are participating. Um, I would like to uh, extend my thanks uh, both to, uh, to Ravi and to the Center for Emerging Markets. Uh, for their support and sponsorship uh, of this effort. Uh, you can see the, uh, the logo there and you can check the website for other uh, activities of, of the center. Uh, as Ravi said, tonight we're kicking off the China Insight series. Um, I would like to uh, let you know or remind you that we're going to have uh, several additional uh, talks in these series, the ones we have scheduled so far. Um, I'll be back in February to talk about uh, many of China's major initiatives, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, Digital Silk Road, et cetera. Uh, George Yip will be here uh, talking about uh, how the US and Europe might be able to catch up with China in digital retailing. 
I'll be back in April to talk about the, uh, the 14 five-year program uh, that China will probably release towards the end of March. Uh, and then Dave Sherman will be here uh, on the challenge for Chinese companies going public in the US, an issue that you would have seen uh, in the news recently. Uh, tonight, though, as Ravi indicated, it's really focusing on understanding the basics of the Chinese system. After 24 plus years in Asia, a lot of that time on the ground in China, what's become very, very clear is that while China, of course, is critically important and is in the headlines in the US every day, that there's not a great deal of understanding in the US uh, about how the system works, how it's configured and how, it's wor how it works. And that really is required in order to understand uh, the headlines that we see uh, on a regular basis. So that's gonna be the focal point uh, tonight. Um, Ravi already gave the, uh, the introduction, so I'll, I'll just skip through this. Yeah, uh, although I had a position at the University of Hong Kong for the last 24 years, the vast majority of uh, my time was actually spent uh, consulting to major multinationals, mostly on their China strategy issues, uh, also to foreign governments on their China strategies, but also to companies and governments in China. Uh, we did... Uh, projects in over 20 uh, jurisdictions, economic development uh, projects for uh, various levels of, of Chinese government. So that's sort of me. You can go to Amazon or Google a whole bunch of books, starting from the one we did in Hong Kong, which came out just before the handover, to the one that came out just a couple of years ago, uh, which is a quite detailed study of the role and the impact that foreign companies have had on China's economy. So as Ravi indicated, I've sort of been doing this for a long time. Um, tonight, as I said, is not really a focus on the current headlines, but on the basics of the Chinese system. And hopefully the questions will also reflect that because quite frankly, in order to get you know, opinions on you know, what this administration or that administration should be doing tomorrow, there are plenty, plenty of forums, plenty of people more than uh, happy to, to pontificate on that, but relatively few forums where people can ask questions on just how does the system work, okay? So that hopefully uh, is what we'll uh, focus on uh, this evening. My apologies, there are obviously some China experts and specialists and many people from China um, uh, on the line. Uh, the focus of my talk is largely gonna be what Westerners need to know on China. Obviously everybody else is welcome, but my apologies for the simplifications or omissions uh, that uh, others may, may see. Uh, first off, let's think a little bit about perspective. And the perspective that we Westerners have to uh, have if we're dealing with China. First off, within China, and for Chinese people, obviously, perspectives and assumptions have been shaped by a distinct local history, culture, and society. Now, of course, there's nothing new about that. This is true in every country. But often Westerners don't understand how different uh, the history, culture, and society are in China from the one that they're familiar with. And that means that we Westerners must be really careful that we don't use our own perspectives and assumptions in trying to understand uh, the Chinese system. In order to figure out what actions, what approaches we want to take, that's fine. But in order to understand the Chinese system, you have to put that uh, a bit aside and try to understand the system on its own terms uh, before we try to figure out how to deal with it. So I'll just give a really simple example. To many people, and again, I'm gonna simplify and stereotype, so please forgive me. But to a first approximation for many people in the US, Chinese history starts with World War II where there was a common enemy and the US, you know, many people feel, and rightly so, we helped to liberate China. Then that was followed by a period in which the Chinese Communist Party took over the government in China. And at that time, of course, US communism was considered as a threat. Then there was the Korean War period where China was on the other side and China was seen as uh, an enemy. 
Then China was a closed uh, country and economy for many years. And many of us in the West, you know, would characterize that as China refusing to be a normal country. Then China started to open. Ah, many Americans, Westerners thought they need us. And opening and us interacting with China will somehow make them more like us. Then, of course, there was the Tiananmen Square incident where many in the West said, if Chinese leaders would do that to their own people, what might they do to somebody else? Followed by, again, a further period of reform, and then that uh, by China's entry into the WTO, where there's a feeling, you know, we let them in, we let them into the club. Then, surprise, China didn't become more like the West. And the view in the US was almost like a jilted lover. They won't play by the rules. They won't do what we thought they would do. And as China increasingly works to reshape global norms, the view of many people, at least implicitly in the US, is that we've been magnanimous and, and they haven't been grateful, or at least not grateful enough. And again, this is stereotyping and oversimplifying. But the conclusion to many is that interaction with China certainly represents opportunities, but China also represents a disruptive force and potentially a threatening force. Well, let's look at the other side of the coin. And what might the view of China or people in China be of US history? Well, first off, US, what US? Because the US was non-existent through most of the 5,000 years of Chinese history. So who were these upstarts? Then, during a century of foreign interference and worse that started uh, with the 1840s and the forced opening of China to trade and culminated with the Second World War, uh, the US, at least in that early period, was viewed as a participant or a collaborator. Uh, although not the worst offender of uh, colonial uh, subjugation of parts of China. Then the Second World War, again, uh, from a Chinese perspective, the US helped, but China, and quite rightly, believes for its own liberation and its own struggle that China you know, did the heavy lifting. And then after that, the Chinese Communist Party took over but outsiders just don't appreciate that the prior system left China divided, weak, poor, and open to attack. And so China was open to, and in many ways needed, a new system, an alternative system. Then from a Chinese standpoint, Korean War, well, that's those foreigners up to their old tricks trying to fear, interfere in either our country or in neighboring countries followed by a period in which China closed, well, in part due to protect itself from foreign influence as it got its uh, nation together and tried to make initial progress. Then followed by an opening, which from a Chinese perspective, well, we may need the foreigners for practical reasons and we're ready to take some initial steps but we actually don't need them in principle and we need to control the interaction. Then WTO entry, instead of being some gift to, uh, uh, you know, presented to China, within China is viewed as a start on the road to China's rightful place in the global economy. China's a large, great nation. It should have a place at the table. And then China not becoming like the West, well, the prevailing view in China is that the system in the West may not, all, not be all that great to start with and may not indeed be suitable for the Chinese context. And then as China works to uh, reshape global norms, the view is largely, well, we want to ensure our freedom of action in the face of sometimes obstructing foreigners just like other countries. And when you start stacking uh, these uh, facts, events, uh, points of view together, you get a conclusion that interaction with the US represents opportunities, but the US represents a status quo power and potentially a threatening force. So if you ask the question, you know, who is right? Well, 
each perspective is built around facts, or as some of us like to say, true facts. Um, each perspective influenced by the lens through which individual events are observed, and also influenced by the process through which events enter national memory. And what does this mean? It means that both of these perspectives that again, I've in a sense stereotyped and caricatured, so forgive me, both of these perspectives are right, but they're both incomplete at the same time. So again, we as Westerners looking at the Chinese system, we have to understand that perspectives differ. We have to try to understand the system as it stands rather than uh, what we think are some of the motivations um, behind. Okay, so let's jump into the system. Uh, the system starts with the Chinese Communist Party, the military, the state system. And of course, most of what we see cited in the press are interactions with statements of acts undertaken by the Chinese government, which has a structure with the National People, People's Congress, a little over, uh, a little under actually 3,000 people, which then has a standing committee. State Council is the main organ of state. That's about 35 people. It is 35 people today. Then there's an executive that does most of the business of state council, uh, that's 10 people, and that's the government. But in some ways, while that's the most obvious, it may be the least powerful of the three main pillars. The second main pillar is the military. And if we remember uh, Mao Zedong, uh, he's the one who told us power comes out of the barrel of a gun. Uh, and the military is what ensures, you know, independence, uh, continued uh, integrity uh, of the state. There is a central military commission, uh, as indicated, the People's Liberation Army, uh, et cetera. And really above everything is the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the National Party Congress is a little over 2,300 members. Out of that is a central committee uh, which does a lot of the, uh, the core work. Um, the Politburo is 25 people. Uh, they're the people that run the show. And out of that 25, seven are members of the standing committee, which are the apex leadership uh, in China. So when we take a look at these three pillars and then layer on the fact that Xi Jinping is chairman of the military commission, president of the PRC and general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, or as the economists once called him, chairman of everything, what we need to understand is actually the position that he's most connected with, which is president of the PRC, may be the least important of these three major positions. And certainly uh, the general secretaryship of the party is the most important. And if you don't want to believe me, um, why don't we go to uh, the latest revision of the Chinese Communist Party Constitution? And these are quotes from the official English language translation, where we see that the Communist Party of China is the vanguard of the Chinese working class, the Chinese people, and the Chinese nation. It is basically the representative of the demands of productive forces. It's the orientation for advanced culture, and it represents the interests of the greatest possible majority of the Chinese people. A paragraph or two down, leadership of the Communist Party of China is the most essential attribute of socialism with Chinese characteristics, the greatest strength of the system. The party exercises overall leadership over all endeavors, all areas of endeavor in every part of the country. And again, in case there's any uncertainty as to who needs to control the levers of power, the Communist Party of China shall uphold its absolute leadership over the People's Liberation Army and other people's armed forces, right? So it is the party overall. This is not ambiguous. It's the core part of the system. Why? Because I say so. No, because the party itself says so. We go on. It's not just the party, but the party also needs to have centralized leadership. This is enshrined under the concept of democratic centralism. 
which it's claimed is both the party's fundamental organizational principle and it's basically how everyday party activities are to be carried out. And correct centralism, which must be practiced uh, throughout the party, involves all party members doing a number of things. But one of the things they must do is firmly uphold the authority and the centralized unified leadership of the central committee, that's the 300 some odd people group, and with comrade Xi Jinping at the core. So it's the party, but the party has centralized unified leadership. And Xi Jinping is at the core. And again, in case there's any mistake or any uncertainty, uh, Xi Jinping is mentioned by name 11 times in the latest revision of the party constitution. And in fact, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era has been elevated to be at the same level in terms of status as Mao Zedong thought and over Deng Xiaoping, who only got a theory, not a thought, and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, whose intellectual contributions don't even merit being named in the constitution. So she has been elevated in the pantheon of Chinese leaders to the same level as the true founding leader of the, uh, of the party and the modern PRC, uh, Mao Zedong. And again, if there's any doubt, Xi Jinping thought is the latest achievement in adapting Marxism to the Chinese context. It's a crystallization of the practical experience and collective wisdom of the party and the people. And it is something that must be upheld long-term and constantly developed, right? So again, this is unambiguous. And under the guidance of Xi Jinping thought, basically the party, will endeavor to carry out uh, all of the major tasks that need to be carried out to build and maintain a great country, okay? So it's not ambiguous, okay? And in fact, the overarching theme of Xi Jinping's administration has been a reassertion of centralized uh, party leadership and control. And he took his position in the party uh, the last quarter of 2012 and his position in the military commission and government presidency uh, in the first quarter of 2013. And already in 2020, he started the party reform process. One of the manifestations was a massive anti-corruption drive, but it was also an effort to reform, to reassert the centralized leadership of the Central Committee, the, stand, the Politburo, the Standing Committee, and the leader of the party. Also to ensure party loyalty and that um, foreign thoughts and thoughts inconsistent with party doctrine uh, would not be allowed, would not be tolerated. This was followed shortly thereafter by a series of efforts that started promoting societal renewal. And part of this was the notion of the Chinese dream, uh, which was a dream not just for China, but for Chinese people everywhere. And the party, again, uh, taking the leadership role in being the representative of a great people, not just in China, but elsewhere as well. Uh, the economic reforms that the Xi administration uh, pushed starting in 2013 were not like many other previous economic reforms in terms of greater open, uh, greater access, uh, less involvement of government and the party in the economy. They were more or less the opposite. It was a reassertion of the central leadership of the party in terms of setting economic priorities, the state in planning and administrating those with lower level decisions, uh, more freedom of action, as long as they stayed in with, within rather the guidelines set uh, by the court. Judicial reform, same thing, more centralization, streamlining, decision-making uh, in the details, decentralized under central direction, military, a massive uh, reform process of streamlining, modernizing, and also centralizing uh, the command structure uh, further. 
So if one were to really describe Xi's uh, terms in office so far, it's been the reassertion and centralization of party leadership and control. Governmental reform, again, streamline, combine some ministries, streamline decision-making and others for the same reason. And China manages a vast country through a very detailed set of plans and documents. There are the five-year programs, there are annual work reports, there are annual communiques of the party Congress, there are a series of state council documents and obviously important uh, speeches of the leaders. In terms of the five-year programs and the work reports, these exist at the national level. Most of the provinces and many of the prefectures have their uh, version uh, of these documents. Topics covered include economic social development, regional development, Individual industries have their own five-year plans. Uh, individual technology uh, initiatives have their five-year plans. The environment has a five-year plan, et cetera, et cetera. And it makes for a great, uh, a great swath of uh, very detailed documents. Now, to an outsider, this is actually a wonderful thing in terms of trying to understand China, because almost unique among nations, China writes down what it's going to do and then actually does it. And in fact, for local officials, be they at the provincial or municipal level or lower level officials in the ministries, these documents are their guiding, their governing documents. And they really need uh, to be able to show that important decisions that they make actually fall within uh, the guidance that are set, uh, set out by these documents. So understanding these documents and identifying the ones that are relevant to you that's an important step in foreigners understanding what's going on in China. Uh, China's legal system has been transformed. Uh, massive changes that went into uh, the thought process in the 70s, started implementation in the 80s. If you were to read many Chinese laws, they actually read a lot like Western counterparts. Uh, and the professionalism in the legal sector has been increased dramatically. And many local judicial activities have been depoliticized to the extent uh, that the, the center has been able to do so. Uh, and many Chinese legal scholars point to the strides that have been made in moving from rule of man, which was certainly the case for the first 20 plus years of the uh, PRC, uh, and then rule of mob almost during the Cultural Revolution, more towards a uh, rule of law and rule of constitution to the extent that one uh, former director of the Chinese Academy of Social Science Institute of Law uh, once said uh, that basically the steps that China had taken to the time, and this was uh, in the early 2000s, were already of epic making uh, significance. Having said that, the reality is, for important issues, politics still dominates. According to Jerome Cohen, who's uh, an American law professor, but uh, someone who has been an advisor to the legal system and legal scholars and government in China since the 1970s, uh, in China, politics continue to control law. In principle, the party controls the system at every level, and basically the party central committee and its Politburo can tell every legal institution what to do. And for those of you who might think, you know, I'm a biased foreigner, just quoting another biased foreigner, we have the following quote, which is China should not fall into the trap of the West's erroneous thinking and the independence of judiciary. Chinese courts must resolutely resist constitutional democracy and the separation of powers. And that's a quote from the Chief Justice of China's Supreme Court. So again, we're not talking about an ambiguous situation. The economic system has been transformed and we know that, right? It's unrecognizable uh, from that which existed in, in 1980 or in 2001 when China joined the WTO. Over 3,000 laws were written, altered, rewritten, or abolished when China joined the WTO. Of course, the results, China's per capita gross national income uh, has gone from 191 US dollars in 1980 to over 10,000 in uh, 2019. And even though I haven't done the inflation correction there, it's obviously a massive increase. 
Uh, China's exports have gone from 11 billion uh, US dollars in 1980 to over 2.6 trillion, with China being by far the world's largest exporter and running by far the world's uh, largest trade surplus. And inward investment from very small amounts in 1980 to 156 billion US just in 2019. And that was down from a peak of over 200 billion uh, US uh, just a couple of years before. And again, for those of you who know China, walk down the main streets in major Chinese cities and virtually all you see are European and American brands in the windows. And many Chinese just walking down some of these blocks could be forgiven for assuming that the foreigners have already uh, dominated and taken over. But, Again, there's a clear hierarchy. The economy works within the system. And what does this mean? It means the party sets priorities, the state plans and administers, national level state-owned enterprise control the commanding heights, the sensitive sectors of the economy, provincial and local state enterprises provide many of the utilities, infrastructure, a lot of the heavy industry, some other goods and services, Local Chinese private sector companies are allowed freedom of action as long as they follow the law and public policy and they don't sort of get too important or too big for their britches. And unfortunately for you know, us foreigners, uh, foreign enterprises are at the bottom of the totem pole. Necessary evils, that's my uh, phrase. That's not the phrase you'll hear uh, in China where you will hear uh, uh, a clear uh, recognition that foreign enterprises do make a significant uh, contribution to China. But basically, uh, foreign enterprises are valuable for the things that they provide that Chinese companies don't or can't at this time. So again, you have to understand the system to understand the way the economy works. And just like on other matters, perspectives differ. When you talk to many people in China about economic opening, they look at the trends. We're still a developing country. We've changed nearly everything at the request of other countries, at the request of you foreigners. Again, we changed, we wrote, we abolished 3,000 or more laws. We dramatically reduced the number of closed sectors, sectors that are closed to foreign companies. And again, walk down a main street in Shanghai or Beijing and then tell me that we're closed. But that's the trend. But in the West, we tend to look at the level. And despite the trend, China still is not nearly as open as many other economies. It's economically powerful. It has the world's highest trade surplus. But a number of the commitments that were made in terms of uh, not forcing tech transfer, IP protection, opening the financial sector, uh, reducing subsidies for exports and industrial policy, well, those haven't all been met. And there are the capital account, communications, internet, many sectors still closed. And China doesn't rank very well in terms of openness uh, in investment, finance, and trade, according to groups like the Heritage Foundation, nor does it rank particularly highly in terms of openness in terms of FDI, foreign direct investment. And there are still a number of sectors that are uh, closed. And of course, as we know, you know over 10,000 of the world's most popular uh, websites are not accessible in China. So which is the right perspective? Both of them have taken real facts, true facts uh, into evidence. So do we focus on the trend? Do we focus on the level, right? China's international presence has greatly expanded. There are major initiatives like the Chinese dream, the societal uh, renewal and regeneration, uh, um, but there are also economic initiatives that I'll talk about uh, in our next session in February, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, trying to link more than 70 countries together with infrastructure, with trade links, investment links, the Digital uh, Silk Road, which is the digital version of the Belt and Road Initiative, the Thousand Talents Program, trying to attract uh, leading researchers from the rest of the world into China, uh, et cetera. Uh, so there are major initiatives, but there are also some areas that are contentious. 
um, some past conflict in the South China Sea uh, with Philippines over uh, fishing rights, etc. cetera. Um, publication that China, uh, the mainland PRC, has been considering what to do in case there ever became a conflict with Taiwan or over Taiwan. Uh, there has been shooting uh, in disputed territory between uh, India and China. Uh, Australia, when it called uh, for an investigation of the COVID origin in China, uh, was hit by uh, a prohibition or substantial limitations on many of Australia's exports to China, even though Australia has a free trade agreement with China, and even Sweden. I mean, Sweden gets along with everybody. Uh, but not too long ago, there was an incident where some Chinese tourists uh, felt that they were mistreated and the Chinese ambassador to Sweden uh, used some non-diplomatic terms uh, such as reminding Sweden that in essence, it was like a 48 kilogram boxer going up against an 86 kilogram boxer. In other words, we're big, you're small and do not forget it. I won't even bother mentioning the various areas of contention with the US and there are others as well. So there is international presence that's in, uh, increasing and that has a couple of different aspects and facets to it. One of the facets is uh, the United Front. Uh, the United Front uh, is, uh, operates both inside and outside of China. It is regarded as an important magic weapon strengthening the party's position and an important magic weapon for realizing the China dream and the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Is that some evil foreigner? No, that's a quote uh, actually from Xi Jinping, translation of a quote from Xi Jinping addressing uh, the United Front uh, Working Group uh, in 2015. And again, not to confuse, uh, the United Front is a political alliance and United Front work is political work. It must maintain the party's leadership throughout. And this is from the person who is the director of the United Front work department. Why is this interesting? Why is this important? Because many of what otherwise are billed as cultural outreaches, friendly overtures, state to state or people to people interaction are coordinated on the Chinese side, ultimately through the United Front. Okay, so we just need to be aware. And in fact, the uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute has done quite a detailed study, which points out that the leadership of the United Front goes right to the top. One of the people of the standing committee of the Politburo, one of the top seven people in the country oversees United Front work, along with members of the Central Party Secretariat, State Council, the main organ, the chief organ of government is involved as well. Uh, ministries and agencies that coordinate some, certainly not all, but some of their activities through United Front our state security, foreign affairs, propaganda department, culture, tourism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And who are the targets for outreach? In some case, again, it's just outreach, um, soft power projection, uh, communication, uh, sharing knowledge. Um, but some cases, you know, there was an Australian senator who was found to have uh, taken money from United Front organizations, etc. In some cases, it's more overt attempts at influence. And targets include business, political figures, Chinese community groups inside and outside of China, media, entertainment, uh, etc. So United Front is, is an entity that projects a Chinese soft power. Is this any different from what the US does? Well, in concept, no. Um, the reality is that China is probably way more organized and probably these days way more uh, effective. But again, we just need to know. So, uh, you know, again, we don't have a lot of time. So let me just jump to some lessons. If we think about the political and government system, um, it operates on a different basis than those in the West. This should be clear even from the very brief snippets that I've been able to go through. In the Chinese system, the party and the government are for the most part above the law. And what this means is that China's interest as determined by the party and or the government 
is not only a valid, but it is an overriding criterion in which to decide cases and to determine policy, regardless, in many cases, of whether that runs counter to a written law. Like other countries, China views international negotiations uh, and agreements through the lens of its own legal system. And that means that such agreements tend to be honored, certainly when they align with China's interests, but when they don't, well, the China's interests often are viewed as superseding what's written on the paper. And that can be very disappointing to foreigners who think they're negotiating on the basis of principles uh, when conditions change and the Chinese party may change its point of view. From an economic or business standpoint, you have to understand the economic hierarchy in order to understand the economic plans. That helps explain the partial openness. It provides insight into uh, what types of Chinese companies will receive support both inside and outside of the country. They're the ones that, again, on these commanding heights or the ones uh, supporting key Chinese initiatives. It provides some insights in terms of the opportunities and challenges that foreign companies and foreign governments face when dealing with uh, economic policy and programs uh, out of China. In terms of the international outreach activities, well, for some nations, uh, these activities can mean uh, ties of friendship. They can mean sources of development aid and investment. The Chinese uh, Development Bank is by far the world's largest development lender. Its overseas portfolio dwarfs that of the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and virtually all the other development banks around combined. China and Chinese outreach can be a, a source of infrastructure linkages through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, can provide opportunities for foreign business, serving both the China market and foreign markets, can enhance regional trade flows. But some of the other uh, initiatives can escalate uh, territorial disputes and tension, can seek overt or covert influence, can result in economic punishments like the Australia case, and can seek to promote Chinese interests over those of foreign nations. Again, there's nothing surprising about it. We just have to understand it and how it works. So how do we understand, we Westerners, how do we need to understand China and the Chinese system? We have to study the history, culture, and society. Any of us who think the Chinese history started with the US helping to liberate China uh, during the Second World War will never understand the Chinese system. You got to go deeper. You got to go beyond that. You have to understand the basics, the hierarchy, party over everything, for example, and how the system is structured. Uh, you have to read the documents. Again, the brilliant thing is that uh, China writes down what it does and then does it. We have to put aside some of our perspectives and assumptions. We have to understand that even if we read the documents, words can mean different things to different people. And then when we see contradictions, we have to resolve them one way or another. An example, economic opening. Is China's economy opening? Yes, it's opening in the financial sector, uh, in environmental technology sectors, companies that have good solutions will find the door wide, wide open. In consumer uh, goods, a lot of them, China's opening and opening more. The number of sectors that are strictly prohibited is reducing. So is China opening? Answer, yes. Is China's economy closing? Also, yes. Because there are some sectors where increased restrictions have been put in place. If you look at McKinsey Global Institute's analysis, it claims that China's economy is less exposed to the world economy today than it was 15 or 20 years ago. So is China's economy opening? Yes. Is it closing? Yes. You got to get into the details to get a meaningful answer. Because this is not a contradiction because China needs and believes it needs input in some sectors and not so much in other sectors anymore. And the principle of opening being good or bad, that's not relevant. Uh, I'll skip the next one. It's a similar example. 
what does it mean? My best tool for thinking about how the Chinese system works for Westerners is the Rubik's Cube. Because what a Westerner will see is different reports coming out of China and they just look like everything conflicts. The trouble is you gotta take the time to twist and turn and twist and turn until the sides align. And it's only when you put yourself in a world where those sides align that you have a hope of really understanding how the system works. Now, in the interest of time, uh, I'll just skip through to the end because there are ways of misunderstanding uh, the system. We do have to remember those of us in the West that by many measures, the system in China has been extremely successful. The lot of life of the vast majority of Chinese uh, has been improved. And this system, uh, while some predict imminent collapse, you know, it's likely to be around for a long time. And we need to address, can two different systems get along and do business with each other? And the answer is yes. The key is negotiating the interfaces, thinking that the systems are different, not that one is good and one is evil. It means therefore that negotiations are based on relative power and interest and trying to understand both parties' underlying concerns rather than trying to negotiate on the basis of high principles that may actually not be shared principles at the end of the day. It means that understanding that China does honor agreements when it's clearly in China's interest to do so or when the cost of not honoring them is high. And if we think in this way, this gives us a starting point that at least in my view, uh, much more likely to lead to success and far less likely uh, to lead to disappointment. I will remind people of our future sessions. And with that, I'll end my prepared remarks. My apologies for uh, going over in time and uh, we'll open up the sessions for, uh, for Q&A. And please submit if you haven't already uh, questions uh, through the chat and Ravi, uh, turn it back to you. Thank you, Michael. I think you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, and there are a number of questions that are showing up in the chat box. I want to start by asking one of my own uh, questions. And, and that is uh, something that has struck me as a bit of a paradox about China is the system you describe of having a highly centralized form of control by one organization, which is the party, which has, I think, 70 or 80 million members in a country the size of China ought not to have produced the results that it has. And you've said they've been very su successful using this model. Explain to us why that system works when it is in fact so centralized and uh, puts so much power in the hands of uh, a small group of uh, people. That is not supposed to work. Uh, in, in some ways, it's not supposed to work. Um, but number one, you have to think of where China came from. And a system that many in the West might view as overbearing uh, is a system that has given China stability rather than chaos. So that's part of it. So people in China are coming from a different starting point and are willing to accept many of the aspects of the system as long as it produces results. Having said that, while again, the anti-corruption drive showed that there were many people in the party who were lining their own pockets, uh, the party, at least since the start of the reform and opening period, has gone step by step and has actually looked outside in terms of getting information and input uh, in order to map a path. In economic terms, it's a follower, not a leader. So it followed, at least initially, many of the strategies that were followed by Japan and then the, the Asian tigers. Uh, and those steps were clear and clearly understood. And a lot of that in the early days was mediated through Hong Kong, which always, uh, at least since the 1800s, had access to first world level um, expertise. Uh, so it's in part because the targets have been clear it's that for one reason or other, the populace has accepted or acquiesced uh, in the leadership role. 
and that the party has been quite aggressive in identifying the stumbling blocks. One of the reasons for the anti-corruption drive was to purify the party, but another reason was that the leadership understood that the party was vulnerable as long as the perception of people at the local level was that of corruption. So these things together uh, are really what has uh, influenced or allowed the system to uh, to persist uh, to the extent it has. Right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a question here about the relationship of the private sector and how you reconcile that with uh, the talk of socialism and a theory of uh, social ownership of the means of production. Uh, in my okay. trips to China, I always found it more capitalistic than many capitalist uh, economies. So how do, how do those things uh, reconcile? Okay. Um, and here we have to separate um, direction and ownership. So the commanding heights, what are considered the most important sectors, the most important companies, be it the telecom companies, be it the, uh, the oil companies, uh, et cetera, uh, these are state enterprises, uh, either directly or even if they have listed shares, the state controls. So the commanding heights of the economy, the state controls. Lower down, uh, and what's happened is the scope for the private sector has been hugely increasing. But it gets back to actually one of the slides uh, I omit, I omitted. And that is Westerners, when they saw the communique of the plenum, uh, the third plenum of the 18th party Congress, they saw a line in there that said, the market will be decisive. And they all thought, great opening government reduced uh, emphasis, et cetera. But the reality was it's within the system. And within China, what the leadership is trying to do is get greater efficiency through market forces while still exerting centralized direction over the economy. Those of us in the West tend to think of the market as both uh, efficiency through competition and decentralized decision-making. What the party has done, it has made clear decisions about the levers that it needs to control. And when push comes to shove, if a company gets too big for its britches, the control is exerted through control of the financial sector and through uh, the ability to have, um, let's just say, leading entrepreneurs uh, not be uh, in the public eye anymore. Hmm. Can you comment on the different models of ownership and the transition from state ownership to private domestic ownership? And also, what is the role of the party in the management of firms? Because we read that there are party cells in every major company. And maybe you can also explain how does that how how do you have these two different structures of decision making working together and still not be going to paralysis but actually function effectively? Well, part of the answer is it does uh, result in a certain amount of paralysis. Mm -hmm. And again, one can point to many examples where a different system would have streamlined certain decisions and allowed certain companies to grow quicker, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, again, you have hierarchy of ownership. Uh, you have enterprises that are owned by the state at different levels where the ownership is clear. Uh, the central government has a, an agency, SASAC, I won't bother with the acronym, that oversees the state shares. And SASAC acts like a, a shareholder um, and exerts control that way. Uh, and the companies, some of them, it's you know corporatized in the sense of supposed to uh, have commercial uh, goals and ambitions, but overseen within the limits or constraints placed on it by the party, or being able to do things that are coincident with the goals and the initiatives of the party and the government, where if a company is engaged in those initiatives, the bank spigots are open, uh, subsidies are available, and all sorts of support. So it's a combination of carrot and stick. Now, having said that, uh, the days when the control was so tight that new companies couldn't emerge, those days are largely gone. Mm. Uh, there was no five-year plan that said we will develop anything like Alibaba mm. or Tencent or DJI. Uh, and what's one of the good things about the system is today it's open enough 
and is free enough that entrepreneurs in most sectors of the economy can have ideas. Uh, those companies all got financing, both internal and external uh, to China. And China didn't really sort of rein them in until they had already become very big, important companies. So again, is it a process that hinders growth on some dimensions? Yes. Do China's leaders understand this? Yes. And they're willing to pay the price of that uh, reduced growth in order to retain uh, the control or influence that they think is critical. Mm. Uh, you have many thoughts on the educational system uh, and perhaps also explaining, is it uh, capable of producing the skills that the workforce is going to need for the future? Uh, in terms of technical skills, engineering skills, scientific skills, uh, Chinese education is, in, in some institutions, is certainly world class. Um, there's huge variation in such a large uh, country. You have some very top institutions, which in scientific, engineering, technical subjects are already world class. And then, of course, you have a whole uh, hierarchy. Um, in other areas, well, you know, it varies uh, depending on uh, the openness of a particular area in terms of thought process, uh, communication, uh, et cetera. But certainly now there is enough openness in the market uh, that you know entrepreneurial fervor in uh, in China, at least in parts of China, is the equal of, if not the superior, of what we we see in the U.S. Uh, are they instituting uh, you know better education, better training? Certainly, yes. Uh, is there still a party uh, training and indoctrination? A answer also yes. Uh, and will that combination be successful? Well, it's taken them where they are so far. My view, quite frankly, is it can take them to probably double today's per capita income. Uh, that would be over 20,000. And at that point, uh, more creativity, individual thought process, not just in the scientific uh, arena, may become a binding constraint. But I don't see that happening for another decade or so. Hmm. Yeah, that sort of leads into maybe it has to be a last question, uh, or maybe one more after that, if we can go just a minute or two longer. Uh, and that is, do you think the system is going to be able to deliver results going forward into the future? And you sort of touched on it by saying you think it can go until maybe a further doubling of the income. Is that is that a fair conclusion? Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, interesting things always about China is, is people forgetting that it evolves and it changes. When I read an analysis that says, and if Chinese leaders do exactly the same thing for the next you know, seven years, I stop reading because they're going to change. They're going to evolve. It's constantly evolving. And the people are actually pretty smart. I mean, the quality of, uh, of officials at various levels, uh, quite frankly, compares quite favorably uh, to levels of, official, of officials in, in other countries. Um, so uh, the question will continue to be, can the system as it is uh, in place now continue to deliver the material well-being improvements in people's daily lives that compensate or more compensate for the trade-offs in the system. Yeah. And that is the challenge. Uh, and I think no one can say that that's uh, going to be true indefinitely. Um, my view, and again, I'm a Westerner, I have all you know the prejudices that other Westerners have, but when I try to put those aside, you know, I say that this is sustainable as long as the party continues to evolve. And maybe you can try to explain, I know it's not easy in a minute or two, why is the party, and I've heard it's a kind of a meritocracy of its own, that the people who rise to the top have been tested uh, for certain kinds of competencies. Uh, and also, for, I don't know if this is true or not, that mo most of the leaders or many of the leaders are engineers, and very well educated and so on. Uh, whereas you don't see necessarily see that in other countries. Uh, so 
can you tell us something about the inner workings of the party and how it's able to co-opt and bring within the tent, within its fold, uh, so much talent and then actually able to sift through and move better people to the more competent people to the top? Okay, well, one thing is that while, again, all capable people certainly do not join the party, as you say, it's under 90 million uh, in membership. But for many people, many high flyers, they're recruited in. And if you want to reach the upper, upper, upper echelons in China, uh, you know, eventually you, you become a member of the party. You know, that, that is the place where the power is. That, that's where the, the decisions are. So there is a sort of self-fulfilling as well as a recruiting uh, process. You know, the Singapore government uh, identifies high flyers and brings them into government. Uh, and often that means bringing them uh, into the, the PAP. In terms of how that process gets managed, and again, I'm going to dramatically oversimplify, so our Chinese friends, please forgive me. For the first 20 or 30 years of the PRC, certainly, it was sort of who you knew. And it was who you knew at the national level. It was who you knew at the, uh, at the local level. But starting in the 80s, there was a massive reform of how the party uh, did its, its, uh, its processes. Um, and there was a very real attempt to first set up education within the party, the range of party schools, both the central ones and the local ones, but also the notion of identifying high flyers and then rotating them through uh, different positions, positions in ministries, positions in geographies to get them experienced. And when you have 33 provinces or equivalents, 334 prefectures, multiple ministries, uh, you've got ample testing ground. And really since the late 80s, early 90s, what we started seeing was people be put in place uh, by the organization department of the Communist Party uh, based largely uh, on merit. And in fact, it used to be in the old days that all of the local uh, head of government and head of the party in say Guangdong province, you'd have a Guangdong governor and a Guangdong party secretary who for, were from Guangdong. Hmm. But nowadays it is rare. And in fact, I don't think there is a major jurisdiction that has both the party secretary and the head of government from that jurisdiction. Hmm. People are rotated in from the outside. Their loyalty is not to the location where you rose to the top knowing where the skeletons at everybody else's closet were. You rise to the top now by being identified as a high flyer, being rotated around. Your loyalty is to the center. It's to the core and to your ability to deliver on central government initiatives. Is it a complicated process? Heck yeah. It's almost like you know, the Chinese Communist Party is like the world's largest company that never hires from the outside. They always promote from within. And once you understand that, it actually makes predicting who the leaders are going to be in the future not all that complicated thing, a thing. You may never be able to guess who's going to be number one, but you know that the next number one is at some point going to be a member of the top 25 yeah. who's going to be drawn from the top 376 right mm -hmm. uh, so it's a huge process and there is an entire department that spends 24 7 just organizing the selection promotion and location and job assignments uh for the high flyers within the party yeah well, I think we're going to have to leave it at that, Michael. Uh, I see many more questions in the chat box. I'm sorry, folks, we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but I, I, I think you can see that we could spend five hours and still not get through all of the questions. This is such a big topic and so complex. Uh, but you've given us a start, Michael. And I think we all look forward to the remaining uh, speakers in the series coming up. I think you're coming up next. And then after that, we have George Yip. Uh, followed by Michael again, and finally, Dave Sherman. Uh, so I'd like to thank you, Michael, for a scintillating and thoughtful talk. We've given us a lot to chew on, think about. I want to thank the audience for uh, your participation. I want to thank George Yip for actually coming up with the idea of doing a series. And I want to thank Magda for making all the arrangements. 
And thank you again, audience. And we hope to see many of you back when we do the next event in February. Okay, bye-bye.